Matthias Wolenten, who's giving us a vast presentation. Thank you. All right, so this talk is about my PhD thesis, which has been going on for a while. But software and the theme I'm presenting is vast, which is visibility across space and time. And we've seen something very similar early on from Kurt, um, a similar talk. It's, it's in a similar direction. And this is my, my, these are my thoughts on it. So this here is a document from the Department of Energy containing a bunch of policy guidelines, what to do in certain security critical circumstances. And if you happen to lose uh, or you got stolen um, a nuke, you have to report that to the government within an hour. So they give you an hour to report loss of a nuke. Now, PII data, credit cards, anything, you, you have to report within 45 minutes. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it's not a problem if you, if you say, hey, sorry, we've lost this 10,000 accounts, and 40, 50 minutes later you say, and by the way, we also lost the nuke. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and this kind of shows why it is necessary to have fast incident response. And um, I would like to show you an example of what the system looks like that I'm currently building. It's not fancy looking GUI, so it's a lot of textual um, processing, but right now it, it will hopefully still convey the idea. So I'm going to start BAST server in the bottom, in the top panel. And I have preloaded traffic um, from, how much is it? That's actually, these events, actually I use the second day here. This, let's look at how long it takes to count those lines. This is output from a bro run. One day of traffic at our institute in Berkeley has a 100 megabit uplink. And it's, I can see it by the kind of the IDs that are associated with the events that roughly 70 million logs from this single day. And these are the logs that are just those in this pattern. There's actually a bit more, but I have not bothered looking at them all. Okay, so it took roughly a, how long did it take? 20 seconds to count those 70 million lines, just to count the lines. Really this, what WC does, it just goes over the files and looks for the new line and does plus one. And okay, there was a, they were compressed, so some sort of decompression took also place there. But, um, as an, as an analyst, I would like to browse through this entire archive really interactively and not just counting lines. And this is, this is the current state. It's a small shell where you can go into an ask mode and run a query. And if I would like to know, for example, all originating hosts in a subnet, in our ICSI subnet, which is 129, 192, 150, 186/23 almost looks like the private one. We get a lot of scans that are poorly implemented. <laughs> um, and, and I would like to search, say, a MIME type that contains application for, say, PDFs or something else. I run this query, and I get answers back immediately. It's, this, is, this is right now 70 million. Due to a technical issue, I've tried this with one order of magnitude logs higher, 150 millions. It gives me a bit too much results yet. I'm tweaking that, but it's the same exact same performance. I can I get the hits immediately. This is just 12 hits, so that's, it's not a lot. And the, the display is also not very conducive to consumption. It's the plain data that's dumped as if it would occur in a bro log. But um, there's also, I could ask the exact same query and um, run it on the command line. There's all, this is the interactive mode. There's also a different mode where just, uh, say, export bro logs. And this is the same query here on the bottom, exporting the result as a bro log. 
or I could also say uh, I export it with the output format of JSON, and I get the same thing in JSON. So this is roughly what the system currently is aiming at and how you can plug it into your pipeline. Um, let's look a bit how this thing is designed. It's, it's essentially very simple. There's two sides of fast. One is getting data into it, and one is pulling it out. And this is the, the import side, the export side, as I will refer to later in, in the talk. And the idea is also to have a unified platform here with a very expressive invent model, like the model that we have in Bro2, which has sets and tables and high-level data types, such as addresses, ports, and maybe even <coughs> user-defined ones, like the compositions of strings, like URLs. I was talking with Vlad about that earlier. And the system should be interactive, scalable, and, and typed. That's, that's the primary, these are the primary objectives um, when I set out to design this thing. And how does it relate to Bro? Really, I mean, if, if, if I'm preaching to the choir here, you have all these logs and you don't know what to do with them. And um, maybe you even want more than just logs. Also, some fine-grained activities that exist only in certain uh, applications while they're run. Like in Bro itself, you have the HTTP header events. And um, by default, Bro does not print them out. But let's say if you wanted to take all these events and look, search them, then VAST would, for example, be a candidate to, to get all this data. And I'll, we'll see later how it makes sense of that. So this is the uh, punchline about the name. It's, there's two components. The spatial visibility is to have a unified data model where you can get all the activity without having to switch between different uh, styles of expressing activity. Like a firewall configuration is very different than, say, uh, grabbing through logs. But it's all, it's all about activity. And then there's the temporal aspect where, where I would like to say, well, it, run a certain query and say, hey, whenever I get new activity for that one, please notify me. So you've done all the dirty work of identifying the exact query you want to get the malicious activity or the activity you're interested in. And then you want to notify that or share that with other users. And when designing such a system, we have, to, we have a few design space options. And right now, the sledgehammer is MapReduce. It's always a full scan of the entire data. It's spread over a bunch of mapper nodes and then reducers. But at the end, you do a full scan for each query over the entire data. This has no restrictions on algorithms. You can run whatever you want, fancy regex searches. But I mean, that's also the downside. You have to do the full scan always. At the other end of the spectrum is in-memory cluster computing. And Spark is very popular right now. This, the idea here is you load the entire working set into memory, but not on a single machine, but into a cluster of machines. And essentially, your data set is distributed in memory over a bunch of machines. And when you run a query, uh, Spark is clever enough to run it so that it runs on all nodes, a fraction of all nodes. Or the data is split across all the nodes that when you, when you perform the query, that you only uh, pay an nth, say, of your cluster of n nodes, and you get the result. This is fast as long as the data fits into memory. I mean, we are here talking about terabytes and petabytes of logs that, that you don't necessarily have that cluster <coughs> available, where you, even if you have a lot of money, you cannot still get the entire data set into memory. And then at that point, you actually run into a thrashing when you want to run a query over the entire data set, you, and you use Spark, you begin with, lurk, with loading the first half into the data set, run the query, and then swap it out for the second half, and so on. And that is essentially degenerating into MapReduce, but you're using Spark. So that's not the point of using Spark. And so what, do we, what, what, is, what is the approach that follows? I mean, you can do two things. Either you sample the data when you run a query, you only on a, on a subset and then maybe extrapolate from the based on the results. Or you, if you're interested still in precise answers, 
And for security critical ap um, applications, this is what we often want. We need a very space efficient way of getting to the data quickly. And for that in VAST, I've come up with a architecture that is based on distributed indexing at the cost of expressiveness in the query language. So the system is really for retrieval and not for arbitrary computation. And how does this look like now that we've seen a little bit about it? So data import concerns prologs, instrumented SSH agents. Let's say there's, we use broccoli nowadays in the Bro ecosystem for a bunch of stuff where we don't have the visibility. For example, SSH traffic, the, the LBL has created an instrumented version of the SSH daemon that sends to Bro the uh, login details and I think even every command on a, that's being issued in a SSH shell s creates a new event and sends it to Bro. And they use that to have more visibility to this encrypted SSH session and, and make sense out of it. And in the same way, you could, for example, imagine instrumenting an SSH D with, and, and send events directly to VAST for that purpose. Then as the data enters the system, so this in this dash line is the VAST core, which is kind of what you would deploy in a, either on a beefy box or on a cluster of commodity machines. Um, you send the system, you send the data to, to the core and it gets a copy. The data is compressed and stored into the archive. And then also VAST has these secondary indexes that point into certain events in the archive. And when users interact with the system, they, they send queries to it, perform an index lookup, the index goes into the archive and then extracts the events that match. This, we'll see that in a second um, after I roughly explain how the query language looks like. It's basically Boolean expressions, Boolean algebra. We have conjunctions, disjunctions, negations, and predicates, and combinations of these. And I, there's a, this is right now the very first version of it. So I imagine there is going to be fancier operators in the future. But basically, uh, this is the scaffold I'm building on. And uh, there's different types of predicates. For example, you could ask for a schema, as you have in a bro log, con.id.origh to get a specific field. But because the system is highly typed, you say, oh, I don't know my schema. I just say, colon type, a string, for example. And I get, I run a query over all fields that happen to be of type string. string. And in the same way, you could also restrict your query to metadata of the event, such as the event type, a con log or DNS log, and timestamps. There are some examples here where you say uh, time less than now minus two hours. So everything that was happening uh, before two hours. And this is a point query where you ask for a specific IP address. Uh, this would be an example of metadata querying of the event, the event name. And this is, uh, uh, so we are, there's also operators for containment in. An IP address is in a subnet, for example. That's this operation that's specific to IP addresses that I've showed you also in the very first part of the demo where I queried for every IP address in, a, in our subnet where the originator was there. So there was every outgoing connection, essentially. So these are, the reason behind the strong typing is that you can also then benefit from the operations that are available on these types. And for IP addresses, it would be, for example, uh, subnet searches. For sets, it would be set membership. For strings, it would be substring search. And substring search is either possible with in or ni. And uh, there's some sh shortcuts. If you squint your eyes, it looks kind of like an e, like a mathematical element in. And um, that's just a syntactic sugar for in and ni. They are not really symmetric because the contains relation is not the same if you would flip, flip it around. That's why there's currently in and ni. Uh, both versions are provided. So whereas an example here, foo is the substring in the haystack. So the needle in the haystack, it goes this way and not the haystack in the needle. That's, 
That's it's a currently a limitation because on the, I make assumptions in the query language, which what can occur on the left hand side of the predicate and on the right hand side. This will probably vanish in the future where you just specify the value on the left hand side and you always have the same operator, don't have to worry about it. But you hope you get the idea. Um, this is what the current query language supports. And how does a query actually look like? So it starts with the client. That was the shell earlier on. So starting to issue a query, and it's going to this search actor. And this is just a component in the system. I'm going to call it an actor and explain later why it's called that way. It's a, a unit, essentially, of uh, structuring in the application. So then this, this query, I'm going to send that to the index. And the index consists of partitioned, horizontally partitions. And each of these partitions have their indexers that are responsible for a subset um, of, of the values. What, this, what search does, it parses the string, validates it, sends it, and spawns also a, spe a specific, a new actor that's used just for this query to interact with the client. And, um, that is a kind of a handle that the user then interacts with when it asks specific things. Give me more results from this query, or hey, I want to I want to shut it down or something else. When the query is sent sent along, it's split up into its components. So, for example, here is the source equal to 10.001 and port 53 UDP. There's one indexer responsible for each value, and the in parallel process the result, come up with the result, send it back to the index where it's actually cached. So whenever this predicate occurs again in a new query, we don't have to ask it if it, there was a change to it. We can just combine uh, those, those predicates in different queries and get there by the interactivity that we need when we want to refine queries. If an A and B and C, and then you add, add D, then the cost of the query is really just D, because A, B, and C have already been computed. So then the result is, gets back to the query, and the query then goes to the archive and looks for the real data. This is just the index hit. And then you look for the events that are in a segment of data and extract them one by one. And the, the client really pushes here on the extraction. It's like a Google result. You get half a million hits, but you don't get all the hits at the same time. It's really incremental as you query them. It's this iterator model. And then you can get, get the results out. So is that roughly clear how it kind of the workflow goes? Good. OK, now let's look a bit deeper into the individual pieces that we've just sketched. So, the archive, this is the raw data. This is where essentially your, your file system of logs. And they are compressed and put together a little bit, stuffed together for space efficiency. And the, the, I don't want to dwell too much on the terminology, but this is kind of explaining the implementation a little bit, that uh, an event is just a sequence of, of values, and each value has a type. And uh, this sort of metadata is, is uh, being placed into a chunk up front so that you really only have to store the data once you, have, um, um, once you deal with this in a, in a compressed format. And these are, again, then organized into segments on disk, 128 megabytes each, for example, consisting of uh, several thousands of chunks, so based on how many events are in a single chunk. This, this is how the data is represented in the archive. And the type system is very similar to Bro. There's a bunch of basic types on the left, the red ones. And uh, there exist also vector types or container types, vectors, sets, and tables, which each have a subtype, the element type, or key type and value type. And there's compound types, records, where they see structs, for example, where you have named fields. And with this model, you can essentially create arbitrary types yourself, to like URLs, for example. And uh, this is where I want to go to. That with this building block, you can essentially represent arbitrary activity. Let's look a little bit how this index 
enables these fast lookups. This is really the, okay, I have 10 minutes left. Um, each event has a unique ID. And from an ID space, of 2 to the 64 minus 1. And if we think about an event being a position in this space, we can think about it as being a vector of bits. And there's a one bit at the position that represents the single event. So event 42, if I would have a, a hit of a result hit that is just event 42, I would have a vector with all zeros except at position 42, there's a one. This is how you would represent sequences of events, hits. And, or in this case here, for example, four, seven, and eight would have at position four, seven, and eight, a one associated. And this, you would think, wow, this is way too much to store. Like two to the 64 minus one, we cannot have that in memory. For a single hit would be huge. But because they are compressed, it's actually feasible. They're compressed with the fancy encoding schemes, and I'm using a specific one because most of them are patented, uh, except EWA. And in the future, I plan also to come up with a custom one. It's pretty hairy implementation-wise. But these enable then bitmap indexes, which have the advantage that they are append only, meaning um, you only, when you build your indexes compared to B trees or all other sort of text indexes, they have to be rotated and reallocated, and there's, there's these processing spikes that you occur, but bitmap indexes are purely append only. You, you, it's like a pushback and a vector at the end. It's, you only pay as much as you append for each operation. There's no, uh, there's no extra cost that is occurring. And the advantage of this representation is that it allows composition really nicely. If, you have, if we have a query with three predicates, say x equals to an address, y less than a value, and then a set membership query, and each of these represent a bit vector of results, I can perform the bitwise end of them to get the actual result that I'm interested in, the conjunction of all three predicates. And this is because it's a bitwise operation under the hood. It's very, very efficiently supported and fast by most native operations. And here's another nice thing is that you don't even have to decompress the bit vectors to perform the bitwise operations. They can be done while they're compressed. OK, I'm going to touch this only briefly because we don't have a lot of space, and I want to show you more of the, of the system. Where a lot of the flexibility comes from is the uh, implementation models or structure of software, is, which is called the actor model. It, comes back, it dates back to a 73 from Hewitt, who has devised it as a almost, yeah, to model actually physics. But, but the system is that each actor is a sequential unit of processing, and each actor has a mailbox. And when you, when you structure your software in this way, you get the concurrency out of it by just running, that the fact that they all run in parallel. And you have a fixed number of threads that you map to your cores in the box, and these actors are logically scheduled and with the user space scheduler on top of on top of the actors. So as long as you have a lot of actors in your application, if you structure your application that it exposes a lot of concurrency, it always will nicely scale. And that's, that's, that's what's going to help to bring um, VAST both exploit all cores on an available machine as well as scale over a cluster of commodity machines. And th the nice thing with this specific implementation that I'm using, it's we also going to use that actually in the next version of Bro, of the underlying communication system at Broker that we are currently developing. John is leading that effort. Um, it relies on the exact same principle, on the exact same actor model to achieve a foundation for uh, yeah, modern message passing architectures. And in this model also, this is completely network transparency. You could this, the, the, the data that's being sent between actors is not necessarily, uh, it can be on the one hand, it can be just a single pointer that you pass in your application, 
But if it happens to be that these actors live in two different nodes, the runtime takes care of serializing the data and um, getting it to the other side. So, and, and even those actors can live on GPUs where you have massive amounts of concurrency if you want to do compute intense tasks, such as building bitmap indexes. This is future work. Okay, so BAST is currently in a prototype fashion, but I've shown you, you can already play with it a little bit. And uh, the performance is there. I've tested this with, with uh, hundreds of millions of events, but um, I have, uh, yeah, I essentially, right now the example runs over only 20 millions of events to some technical limitations, but um, it, it should run with a modern compiler, and that's actually the only problem because I'm using C++14, a standard that's just been ratified. Uh, it's very hard to actually get, a, get it installed, so you need a new version, a relatively new version of Clang to get, get it there. But you know, we, if you have issues, all the code is BSD licensed on GitHub. You can uh, download and play with it and submit issues if you have trouble on responsive to this. I'm gonna skip this part actually, which shows the import process, and we're gonna go right like, directly into a little bit of usage. So in this case, you can, <laughs> this shows how to ingest data into the system. You spawn one process, the core, that was the dashed line part that I showed you earlier, and then you can import a con log, for example. It's, again, the same? Huh? Okay, so this kind of concludes my talk with this few, with small, with an example. I wanna show you a few more examples and then be done. Um, so let's say I, uh, well, let's say I, there's a specific IP address I would like to look for. What, where is it? Um, and I don't know exactly, I don't care where it occurs, I was just the address. So then I can use this address um, predicate and say 192.158.158.19. Yeah, actually I think I may be able to switch these two. So now it's to switch the panels simply. Hope, hope that is good enough. And. Uh, I was not in the right mode. Uh, okay, it's the same thing again. Right. Mm. And this, I'm, I'm gonna do this only short because I'm, we're running out of time, but then I'm gonna ask one of you also to submit a query and we'll see what happens. So, okay, this was, this was 17 different indexes that have been hit in parallel, and this is, this is the result. So it's really just, this is an SMTP log, and I got, it got 30,000 hits, and you can, I could now go through this and extract them all one by one until I, uh, until I get to my information that I desired. It's not very, th there's gonna be a web front end for this, Vlad Brownian. Sorry, I saw email. It's only email, so this, yeah, <laughs> we'll not. <laughs> So maybe I should have uh, said something like, uh, and, uh, and type not SMTP. Uh, I was, again, not with something. Oh, actually. Yeah, okay, this is, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll try this again. <laughs> This is the, the, the demo gods are not with me. Okay, so what do you want to know? Oh, okay, let's look for something, scanners. We have had that earlier. So that's a substring, string search on all strings that are scanner. I can, this, <laughs> uh, that was a user agent, I don't know if you've seen it, Morpheus fucking scanner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, not a lot of hits, but I, I queried a total of, um, whoop, let's go on the bottom one, how many, 73 different indexes, and each index covered 20 million events, essentially. So 
um, that, that, that was all, and you can actually, while the index hits are accumulating, already extract results. So this is completely asynchronous. Uh, yeah, I hope you get the idea of this system. And this is a tool, hopefully, soon a bit more stable than this and available to all of you. So thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, let me know.